Welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and we are talking today about transportation issues for the state of Oregon. Capital Insight is a program that's designed to give our audience some insight into the goings-on in our state capital and how we handle issues and concerns of our citizenry in state government. My guests today are two gentlemen who are heavily involved in transportation now and in the future. One of our guests is the Director of the Department of Transportation, Don Forbes. Welcome to Capital Insight. And our other guest is a gentleman who is working with Mr. Forbes. It's Paul Meyerhoff. Paul is especially assigned, I was going to say designed, but assigned to develop our transportation plans for the future. He also is head of the Aeronautics Division. So without further ado, we'll get into a little bit of discussion of transportation. But as we move into that, I always like folks in our audience to have some idea about the, the folks that we're talking with. And Don, can you tell us a little bit about where you come from? Uh, actually, I grew up in Salem, and then uh, took me some time to get back after high school. Uh, I graduated in '65, and took me until 1988 to get back to quite the a city. departure. Right. What did you do in between? Well, in between, I uh, I spent four years at the Air Force Academy in Colorado in Springs, and then five years as a line pilot in the Air Force, so uh, a couple different locations. And then after I got out of the Air Force. Uh, spent uh, about 13 years as a consulting engineer designing buildings and bridges and then came to state government in 1988. Now when you came into state government in 88 what was your position? Did you move right into transportation? At that point I came in as the head of the highway division which was the first time in their 75 year history that they'd taken someone from the outside uh, but they were looking for a little different management style. I'd had uh, not only some practical experience managerially, but had advanced degree uh, in management as well. So it was a nice mix. And uh, then last summer in July, I was chosen to be the director of the department. Now, you're working with another fellow who has a background in flying, and that's a Mr. Meyerhoff, Paul Meyerhoff. Now, Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you hearken from? Well, I, I grew up. Kevin in San Francisco, California, and uh, got my undergraduate degree at the University of California at Berkeley in economics. And uh, then I moved to Alaska in 1975 uh, to work in the, uh, the ski industry. And I was in Alaska for 15 years. And the Department of Transportation sought me out when they were doing uh, their search for a new aeronautics administrator back in 1990. So I moved here to Oregon in 1990, actually with, uh, with intent because my son, uh, by previous marriage, had moved to Bend, Oregon uh, in 1988 with his mom and, and I wanted to be close by. And my current wife is from Portland and uh, it, interestingly enough, as I go back in some family history, uh, my great-grandparents uh, and great-great-grandparents were from the Portland area. So uh, I've got some family roots in Oregon that go back to the, uh, the middle 1800s, well, which is you, kind of neat. You've returned to the family <laughs> fold. <laughs> I have. Um, I, got a mas uh, I earned a master's degree in business from the University of Alaska while I was up there, uh, and then spent quite a bit of time in the aviation industry uh, after my ski days. Now, I was playing with that a little because we already know about uh, Don having been at the Air Force Academy and having been a pilot, and uh, shifting because I'm aware that you're a, you're a civilian pilot. Right. And that ties in with your work in aeronautics for the state. Uh, how did you go about getting into flying? Well, actually, I got into flying when I was a, a small, small young man, when I was about eight or nine years old. My dad was a military pilot uh, in the Army Air Corps in World War II. And uh, he used to fly in his business later on in the 50s. And I was always the kid in the family who said, take me, Daddy, take me. I want to go fly. So we used to go flying quite a bit. And I always had an interest. and. Uh, uh, along about 1980, uh, I was working in a position where I could actually afford to, to learn to fly and then, and then take it up both as a hobby and then to use in the business I was doing at the time. Well, you now get to use it in your present business because you handle the aeronautics for the state, for the Department of Transportation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, aeronautics really is a, a small division of the department, but a very important one because it's mostly air transportation involving both passengers and freight, both general aviation and commercial aviation, and we, we really work all those four areas. Um, one of the exciting things that we're involved with from a general aviation standpoint this summer is uh, a program called the Oregon Air Tour, 
which will be taking a group of 50 planes starting in Cottage Grove and ending up in Hood River, flying around the state, basically promoting aviation in the state of Oregon. Another exciting program that we're doing this summer is a, a seminar up in Redmond for the commercial air service airports in the state. And we're going to be talking with uh, the current airlines, Horizon Airlines and United Express, that service a lot of these smaller airports in Oregon. We're also going to be talking with Advantage Airlines, which is a new startup carrier out of Medford, which is putting a lot of pressure, heat on the commercial air service market in the state. So we're excited to meet, meet, meet Advantage and learn a little bit about them. Well, one of the surprising facts is that Oregon, the state of Oregon has 34 airports, if I'm correct? Actually, we have 34 state-owned airports, and we have a little over... That's what I meant. I'm yeah, sorry. A little over 100 uh, public-use airports. Now, that, in terms of those state-owned airports, are they spread out throughout the state? Yes. The, the Department of Transportation really fills an interesting niche in airports. Most of the public-use airports are fairly large and fairly active, but the 34 that we own are generally pretty small airports that are there for community access purposes only. Good example would be the airport at John Day. Uh, John Day is an airport located right in the center of the state. Um, it's owned by the state. It's actually managed by the county right now. And that airport really serves an important business access. There's no bus service out to John Day. There's no rail service to John Day. Uh, Highway uh, 26 is the only way you get there other than, than flying. So for emergencies, for light flight, for, for fighting forest fires, uh, it becomes a real important airport. But it doesn't really make a lot of money for the county or the community, not enough to really sustain itself. So the state, like they own highways, owns, owns airports. Now, you're raising an issue, the money issue, that I'll be talking with Don with in a moment uh, in terms of where, where we fund our transportation activities and where we look to fund them in the future. But I had a sort of a, a flow-through question here. When you talk about aeronautics and the 34 state-owned airports, is that general fund money that we use uh, right now to help support those airports? Well, I can say unequivocally the answer is no. Um, all of our uh, airport system in this state is user-funded. It's paid for by aviation gasoline taxes, aircraft registration, and pilot license fees, and a few miscellaneous fees. We use no general fund money at all to fund the aviation system in the state. Now we can shift a little to the uh, Department of Transportation. We know that there's a highway fuel tax, the gas tax, and the, uh, the um, uh, I guess the vehicle mileage tax for trucks. You can tell us a little bit about that. But Don, how do you fund the activities of the Department of Transportation? Most of our activities are, are user fee based. Uh, we have an annual budget somewhere between six and seven hundred million dollars a year. And only one million dollars of that is general fund. Uh, most of our resources come from gas tax. Uh, the comparable side uh, for trucks is what we call weight mile tax, which is a combination of the uh, vehicular weight and then the amount of miles that they travel uh, in a year's time. Uh, we also get uh, aviation taxes and uh, registration and so forth. But most of it's fee-based, uh, user-based. Now, as you package all of that and look to the transportation network, you're responsible for, I'm going to kiddingly say, air, sea, and land. I think it's almost a wartime phrase, but uh, um, you're responsible for how we connect all of our transportation modalities, aren't you? That's correct. That's, that's the leadership role that our department's expected to play. This is really our first attempt. You, you've, you and I have talked about the Oregon Transportation Plan briefly. That's really our first attempt to take a long range look at how those different transportation modes ought to fit and how the system ought to be enhanced in this state uh, to support the economic vitality and the livability of the state over a period of time. Now so yes, that is our job. When we say land, a lot of people will think of roads, and of course there's city-funded roads, then there's county roads, and then there's the state highway network, and then the U.S. interstate network that we participate in. Um, how do those work together in terms of uh, the funding mechanisms? Can you give us a, a sketch of that? Uh, statewide, there's about 45,000 miles of road all toll. The state uh, maintains about 7,600 miles. So we have the smallest share. The rest of it, as you said, are city and county roads. We happen to carry the highest volume on our state highway system, interstate system. The funding for local governments uh, comes from a variety of sources. First, the state gas tax that we talked about. Uh, 
once it's collected is split. Uh, the state gets um, roughly 60% of it. The remaining 40% go to cities and counties. Most of those jurisdictions also augment that uh, tax with either timber receipts, uh, various kinds of other funds. Uh, All right, I'm going to break for a moment and mention to our audience, since we don't have any commercial breaks, which you can be thankful for, um, or sometimes thankful for, that uh, you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and we are discussing Oregon's transportation now and in the future with Don Forbes, the head of the Department of Transportation, and with Paul Meyerhoff, who is working with transportation on that future transportation planning. He's also the head of the Aeronautics Division, administrator of the Aeronautics Division. If you ever have any questions or concerns, feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. And we'll switch back to our guests again and carry on discussing uh, transportation in Oregon. As we talk about it today, uh, and Don, I want to pursue this a little bit, I, m I mentioned financing, and people are all talking about Measure 5 and the effect on state government. Where are we with the Department of Transportation as far as that goes? By and large, the department uh, is secure from a, from a financing standpoint. Again, we only have about, <coughs> excuse me, about a million dollars of general fund, which is really the the, the thrust of, of Measure 5 impacts. The rest of our money is, is pretty secure. I However, should probably interrupt you for a moment and mention for the benefit of the audience that the problem for the state with Measure 5 is the re requirement that we use general fund money to send out to the school districts to replace their lost property tax revenues. That is, the theory of Measure 5 is to reduce local property taxes, whether that's working is another subject, but we're supposed to then increasingly send out state money to the local school districts, and uh, the issue that people are talking about is where we're going to get that money since the state doesn't have that kind of money on hand. But now you're talking about a, a different fund from the general fund, uh, the general fund being our general tax dollars, and I just wanted to interrupt to put that right. in context. Correct. Uh, we are one of those agencies that pe people typically call a trust fund agency. That is, we're apart from the general fund. We've got dedicated sources of revenue, again, like the gas tax that we talked about. Interestingly, the, uh, the money that we will be receiving actually will increase over the next six years. The, uh, the federal government just uh, in December, the president signed a new Surface Transportation Act uh, at the federal level. And through that act, we're expecting to receive about $90 million more a year from the federal government than, than we've had in the past. So our funding looks pretty good. And of course, our job is to turn it around and put it into asphalt and concrete and other kinds of uh, transportation facilities. Uh, All right. Well, shifting with that from where we are now financially, I'm going to get us back to Paul a bit, because uh, you're now the man that's been assigned by Don to help us develop our future plan. And we've, we've referred to the, uh, uh, the Oregon Transportation Plan, and I've got a synopsis of it right here. Uh, I like the label you use, by the way, the New Oregon Trail. I thought that was a, a nice way of leading into all of this. Paul, can you give us some idea of how you're developing this, how this plan is developing? I, I think it, it'd be real important to um, kind of set the stage a little bit by, by saying why, why do we need to do a statewide transportation plan? And probably the best way to, to do that is to ask people to think back 40 years in our transportation system and say, where were we 40 years ago? That had been 1952. In 1952, there was no interstate highway system. It wasn't really even built at the time. It was a dream in an engineer's eye, but it wasn't built. Forty years ago, we were traveling across, across this country by train. And if we flew, which uh, a few people did, we were flying in a DC-3 or maybe a DC-4. That was the way we got across the country. I mean, it was slow. Uh, it was circuitous. It was not uh, rapid. It was not efficient, really. It was efficient by those methods you know, 40 years ago. Today, we have an interstate highway system, which is considered to be one of the wonders of the engineering world. And we have a system of air transportation where you can get not only across the country, but from here to Europe if you wanted to, in a, in a matter of hours, from here to, to Asia in a matter of, in a matter of hours. And, and the whole purpose for this New Oregon Trail, this where do we want to be 
is where do we want to be in 40 years? And when we try to look ahead in an Oregon transportation system in 40 years, it's difficult to really know what technology is going to do to change that. But we do know that there are going to be changes in our population, in the way we live, in where we live, and in how we live. And the real purpose of this plan is to try and set the stage for that growth that we can expect and do it in such a way that we don't see continued congestion, continued deterioration of air quality, and in some people's minds, the continued deterioration of the quality of life that we have in Oregon. Well, when you start talking about that, a lot of issues come to mind. I could say, for example, that we had rail transportation in 1952, and at, a time, at the time we were very proud of how efficient and rapid it was. Yet passengers today, looking at their own experience as passengers, say, on Amtrak, uh, will worry about an hour or two hours delay as, for instance, I experienced on Saturday going from Salem to Portland on Amtrak. We were about an hour and a half, two hours late, and that was a big thing. Whereas, of course, if that had been an airplane flight, people wouldn't have been terribly upset. They would have been adjusting to it. Have we become spoiled in terms of some of our demands of the transportation system, or do we have a right to develop some expectations of timeliness and passenger service? I started to mention the trains, but I don't want to limit it to that. Where should we be going on this? Well, I, that's an interesting point, and I think we do have an expectation of timeliness. There are a number of models around the world where timeliness is very important. Um, and I've experienced delays of, unfortunately, four and five hours and six hours, and sometimes I've heard of delays of 12 hours on Amtrak. And, and for a passenger who has a, has a schedule or a program to keep, those kinds of delays are unacceptable. And for example, if you're going from uh, Salem to Seattle and you experience a four or five hour delay, you could have just as soon gotten in your car and, and, and driven that car to Seattle in that kind of time. And, and, and the purpose in part of that kind of a mechanism of trains is to use public transit or you know mass groups of people to reduce, again, the pollution and, and to improve uh, the air quality, to keep cars off the highway, and, and, and so forth. So I think from the perspective of a consumer, which I, I believe I am, you do have the right to expect timeliness. And when you experience an hour delay on an airline and you're able to make your connection, wherever it might be, uh, you've saved so much time in transit, generally, because you're going uh, two hours by, by jet planes, a 1,000 miles. And it would have taken you 12 hours to get there by train or by car. Whereas by plane, if you, if you miss an hour, it doesn't delay you usually too much. So what you're saying is when we put it in context, and I was thinking about that, if you're an hour late getting into Chicago, but somehow the airline makes its connection so you get into New York or wherever, um, you, it would have taken you several days to drive cross country, at, at least taking decent breaks. So when you put that in context, all right, so I missed in a couple hours, and you sort of plan for that. But if I can drive fairly quickly from here to Seattle, I have some expectations. And if you want to pull me out of my car and get me on a train, that train better give me some real advantages. And one of them ought to be an expectation of timeliness. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. That's, yeah. I might just jump in here. See, I think your question hits really at the heart of the issue. And that is, we know that we're going to experience pretty dramatic growth in this state if any of the projections we see today are correct. We also know we can't build enough highways uh, to take care of that demand. First of all, we aren't going to have the money to build them. Secondly, we're going to have fairly serious environmental impacts in trying to get those designed. And so the only way that we can take care of some of these transportation issues that we see out in front of us is to find other modes that people can use, other ways to travel. Can we learn a little from the Los Angeles experience well, and not develop freeway mania? Well, Los Angeles, Seattle, but, but the way that people will uh, be attracted to those, whether it's train or bus or whatever, is that it is convenient and it is timely. That uh, if they have to go out of their way to use those things and if they have to wait a long time, uh, they're not going to switch. I wouldn't switch. I'd continue to use my car. But if I had very convenient uh, public transportation, if I could fly into Portland International Airport, immediately get on a bus or light rail to go downtown to the hotel and avoid having to rent a car, I would do that. And so I think the challenge for people like Paul and I at the state level is where we can, uh, we'll build the system to support those kinds of, uh, of transportation uh, options uh, and where we don't have direct control, that is, it's in the private sector, we'll do whatever we can to encourage the private sector to pick up those. One of the, the, one of the key tenets of the 
planning process that we're into now, this new Oregon Trail, Oregon Transportation Plan, is a concept called minimum levels of service. Now I remember when I was growing up in San Francisco, we had the Muni, municipal bus service there. And you could walk a block or two anywhere in San Francisco and within about five or six minutes there'd be a Muni, there'd be a bus. And you could get virtually anywhere in that town and within about five or six minutes you knew there'd be a bus to pick you up and you could get transfers and, and, and get where you wanted to go. What we were getting there was convenience, timeliness, and, and you could get where you wanted to go. And one of the concepts in the Oregon Transportation Plan is minimum levels of service. For example, that there should be minimum, a minimum hourly, first, first class, quality service, passenger service, up and down the Willamette Valley. Now that means that hourly you could count on being able to get from Eugene to Portland in some form of passenger uh, service. Now that could be rail, that could be bus, that could be something we don't know about today but uh, it would stop probably in Albany and in Salem and maybe Woodburn in the south side of Portland, but that you would be able to count on that service so that you wouldn't have to wait two hours for that service and that it would be first class so that you wouldn't be on uh, something that was uh, on a bus that was 30 years old and the seats were ragged and torn, that you would feel comfortable, that you would feel safe in that, in that kind of service. Also, we talk about minimum levels of service outside the Willamette Valley and uh, we get into some of the requirements uh, of uh, transportation from, for example, La Grande or Baker City uh, back into the, the Portland area or to Eugene. And this concept of minimum levels of service is, is really important to the transportation plan because it says that in order to uh, pursue a certain level of commerce, in order to pursue a certain level of business, um, that citizens need to be able to count on quality, reliable, transportation systems and tying them together and a lot of this plan ties systems together as opposed to just saying a road system or a bus system we start talking about systems of services that work together all right and I'll mention for a moment to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix our guests today are Paul Meyerhoff who's the manager of the Transportation Development Branch and Don Forbes who's the director of the Department of Transportation if you ever have any questions or concerns please feel free to write me at Capital Insight H395 State Capitol, Salem, Oregon, 97310. And Paul, I don't want to miss out on the point you were just making, and, and Don had made it before about talking about arriving at the airport and taking a bus or light rail, say, into downtown Portland. You're talking about a combining of transportation modalities, recognizing that we're dealing with two commodities, I guess. One is people, and the other is freight or, or baggage and moving them in efficient ways. But when I think about movement, I particularly think the time sensitivity is usually with people. I, I suppose there's some sensitivity on freight too, but I'm less concerned with my parcel, unless it's a, something that has to go overnight or whatever, than I am with my own schedule. And uh, in looking at what we're trying to do and tying all of this together for the future, are you working with the counties and cities on these interconnections, or how is that being developed? So let me take, yeah, let me, Don, don't you? Let me, let me take a shot at that first. Uh, again, this is relatively new ground for us. We haven't attempted in the past to be this comprehensive in our thinking, and so uh, we're really at uh, maybe the first step of a journey. Uh, to that extent, we haven't uh, done a lot directly with cities and counties in terms of planning. We're, we've asked for their input as we develop this, this plan, but when this plan gets adopted by our commission in September, that gives us as implementers, the department, um, something that we can begin to sit down and talk to the cities and counties about. Until then, it, this is really in its formative stage. Uh, we have done other planning with cities and counties, but it's been very short time frames. When we get to this, which is really a 20-year look at the long-range system, that's when it's going to be very important for us to sit down uh, with local government and say, okay, how are we going to make this happen? Who has what part of making it uh, come to, to being. Well, when I think about TriMet and its development and progress mm -hmm. in Portland, I know it's, it's taken a lot of money and a lot of commitment, and we're, but we're getting there. And we're seeing use. We're seeing a, a system that's actually 
delivering what, what was proposed. And if I think about other areas, such as Salem Area Mass Transit District, it sounds like you're going to be starting to, to reach out and work with these groups uh, to develop plans. What I'm most excited about, though, is this interconnection, recognizing the global aspect of transportation. If Oregon is going to be participating as a Pacific Rim state and, and looking to the west and back continentally to Canada and the United States and Mexico, are you developing a... Uh, a funding mechanism for some economic development dollars? Have you thought about trying to tap into our economic development money from the lottery? We haven't spent a great deal of time looking at financing yet, although we know that's an important element of making anything happen. But our focus for this planning effort has really been to describe the system that ought to exist in 20 years, as, as Paul was talking about this concept of minimum level of service. If if people believe in that, uh, if the legislature believes that to be accurate and, and correct and the right thing to do, if local governments believe it, that tells us here's where we're going. Now we all, it's incumbent upon all of us to figure out how to get there. And so we quite literally have uh, not spent much time looking at financing up to this point and have purposely said once we uh, our commission adopts a systems element in September that describes the system, then we'll sit down and look at financing options to help us get there. So to give you some room here, you've got to go through these steps and uh, you'll develop the best possible systems options. And of course, then you have to deal with can we afford it, how do we afford it, and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Let me take you back. We seem to be developing from the idea that the old country road was developed so that farmers could get their produce to market. Uh, then we understood that cities needed to communicate, and this all ties in, it seems, with our economic future. But, and this is something we talked about before we started the program today, there's also the question of quality of life and the growth factor. And I, and I would like to pose that question in terms of the Willamette Valley. How will transportation planning fit in with the quality of life planning for the Willamette Valley? I'll throw that to Don and then to Paul. Yeah, I'll take the first shot at that. Uh, see, it's an interesting, uh, interesting dilemma that we're in. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just pose it to you. Uh, from a transportation standpoint, uh, we know that the, the most efficient way to make transportation work either within an urban area like Portland or Salem or between them is to control the growth. Uh, so you have the urban boundaries in those cities well defined and maintained so you don't have a lot of sprawl. When sprawl occurs, you put tremendous demands to build more system and that costs an awful lot of money. Hence the dilemma. On the, on the one hand, people would enjoy living out in the country, and yet we know if we continue to sprawl, we eventually erode the country. It costs us a tremendous amount in transportation, and uh, we don't. Uh, we end up looking like the Los Angeles of the world. So uh, we're trying to seek a balance. We know transportation is critical in that livability issue, and we also know that there has to be a role in confining those urban boundaries if we're to do our job with a minimum amount of uh, investment. Okay, well with one minute left, Paul gets to throw in his comment. <laughs> Transportation's often an afterthought. These roads that you see out here are often thrown out there after they figure out what, the what they want the community to look like. Unfortunately, then when you reach problems of congestion and you have to build a freeway to respond and you have to take out a series of homes and I mean often, I mean, in fact, there are parts of Interstate 5 that are operated on conditional use permits granted by the counties and the cities in which that freeway was built. They're built as an afterthought and what this whole process is about is making it a a word premeditated effort to develop your transportation systems and your land use together so that the system develops together as opposed to just doing your land use and then saying oh yeah and by the way we now have just decided to put in this major subdivision let's just put a road in but it doesn't fit so it's it's putting the two land use and transportation together that uh, this whole effort in, in one in one aspect is focused on well, with that, I thank you both for joining us today. I've, I've learned a little bit, and I hope our audience have picked up some insight on transportation in the state of Oregon now and in the future. I, I wish we had more time, because I think we could probably have devoted another 30 minutes to the subject. But with that, I'd like to thank Paul Meyerhoff for coming today and Don Forbes. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. And I hope you'll join us in the future on Capital Insight. Thanks again for joining us.
paid for and authorized by Citizens for Mannix, 2003 State Street, Salem, Oregon, 97301.